stage, I'd like to invite Hanif Lalo to the podium. Hanif. Funny you should say that. Good morning, everybody. We're going to start off with a little exercise. I want everybody to sit up. <clears throat> okay. You're going to place your left hand on your chest. Anywhere on your chest, preferably in the center, though. And you're going to place your right hand on your abdomen. Close your eyes. Open them. Tony, where do you feel rises more? Your stomach or your chest? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Devon? You feel it in your chest? Okay. There's a thing called breathing, which we all do naturally, right? And there are different types of breathing. Now, it is said that if you're, more, if you're breathing more from your chest, right? You're doing what is called shallow breathing. And if you're breathing, if you feel the breath happening more from your stomach, it's, it's called deep breathing or diaphragmatic breathing. Mm -hmm. Babies, usually under a year old, naturally do more diaphragmatic breathing simply because their lungs are not fully developed. The Albany Medical Center and Physiology residents report that while adults consume three to four milliliter per kilogram per minute of oxygen, infants consume six to eight milliliter per kilogram per minute. Why is this? As adults, we have become so reliant on our lungs that we have neglected the use of our diaphragm. Also, the stresses of life have kicked in, and owing to the fact that we are beings of higher intelligence, we experience various complex emotions, which, believe it or not, will affect our breathing. The method of breathing from the stomach or the abdomen right, as I said before, is referred to as diaphragmatic breathing, also known as deep breathing or low breathing. This is something that many singers, athletes, yoga instructor, instructors, and physicians, for example, practice or teach. As breathing is a critical aspect of our survival, so too is the cultivation of habits. We find that we used to have such very good habits when we were younger. But, just like breathing, as when we were a baby, we have forgotten some of these and have instead procured some very undesirable ones. Let me talk about lateness. <laughs> as a nation, Lateness is something that is attributed to Jamaicans. True or false? Right. Growing up, I, Hanif Omari Lalo, was never ever late. Yes, Christina, never ever late. In prep school and in high school, I was always early. And out of my six years in high school, I was absent only once. And in high school, only once, but never late. We all know Jamaican mothers. Unless you are dead, you're going to school. <laughs> Nothing is stopping my mother from sending me to school. She could hear a hurricane come. Unless she receive official word from Ministry of Education, me better find myself at school. Even though this culture was ingrained in me by my mother, if I had any sort of meeting with a club or society in high school, or if I were to go out with friends, I would always be not even on time, but early, sometimes way too early. As I got older, I realized that not everyone shared my 
same respect for time. So I started to say to myself, why then should I waste my time to arrive on time when other persons weren't even making that sacrifice? So I started to anticipate people. So I know Reverend John. Same supposed, we, we agreed to reach for 5 p.m. He always gets there all late. I live 20 minutes away. I'm not leaving out until 5.40 because I don't want to stay there and wait 40 minutes for Reverend John to arrive. But as I realized, yes, we know, just to clarify, Reverend John is always early, always on time. <laughs> but this started to affect me in other areas as well. Like for instance, church. <laughs> I remember last year, on a youth Sunday just like this, now we all know church starts at 9 a.m. I got a call from a certain member who shall remain nameless, <laughs> Christina, that <laughs> just, just asking me, where am I? Hello? <clears throat> Christina? <laughs> oh, it's 9 o'clock? And we had several items to perform that morning, and I missed the first item. Needless to say, Christina was livid. I never experienced that side of Christina, and I hope that no one ever does. And it hit a place in me because I don't like to miss things like these. You know, I felt very bad, and Christina didn't make it any better. But I resolved <laughs> that that's not going to happen to me again. So I made a change. Each one of us has our own habits that have been replaced. It could be that we're earning a bit more than we used to, and as a result, we've become less financially prudent. Maybe as students in prep or primary school, we used to revise and recheck your, our work before submission. Or you had a habit where every day that you come home, you used to, you used to revise your, what you learned that day. And then you become so secure in the level of your work that as you get older, high school, university, or even areas of work, due to the lack of practice in that habit, you might find it harder to keep up with the level of work at where you're at. It has always been evident that habits can either make you greater or prevent you from attaining your goals and thus limiting your experience in life. According to OnePowerfulWord.com, there are at least 18 benefits of deep breathing, one of which I will share. Breathing detoxifies and releases toxins. Your body has been constructed to release 70% of its toxins through breathing. Deep breathing helps to remove more carbon dioxide from your body and increases your oxygen intake in your blood, thus improving its quality. In the same way, the practice of our forgotten good habits can reap better results in many areas of our lives, such as school, work, health, and achieving personal goals. Alia Atkinson has placed Jamaica on the map with all her accomplishments in the area of swimming. And I'm quoting something that she said in an interview with Swimming World magazine. Considering where I come from, a lot of Jamaicans don't know how to swim. So my parents thought it was necessary to have all their children know how to swim, she explained. We, Atkinson and her two siblings, grew up around the water. We all started swimming and we all just stuck with it. 
Alia took part in the Olympic Games in 2004, 2008, and 2012. It was in London, 2012, where she placed fourth in the 100-meter breaststroke. But it didn't come easy. Atkinson was required to race in a swim-off for the place in the final. She had set a new Jamaican record and secured her spot in the final, occupying lane eight. 2012 was exceptional, she said. I was 23, and at that one, the meet that is, was for sure the deal breaker. It was I make the finals or I retire. I wanted to see if I'd progress over the last four years. Atkinson successfully proved to herself, her nation, and the world that she had grown as a swimmer, and she had the race of her life, clocking in at 1 minute, 6 seconds, and 93 milliseconds, less than half a second from the bronze medal position. Despite her success in the breaststroke, Atkinson admitted that she, had, she hadn't always had an immediate connection with the stroke. As I was growing up, I was more of a freestyler and flyer, but as I got older, the flexibility came in, and for some reason, breaststroke just clicked, Atkinson said. Atkinson had certainly learned a lot throughout her career. With fame and success comes the inevitable attention from the media. It was one year after the Olympics, and I had done so well, Atkinson said. I thought more people were looking at me. Sponsors, the Jamaican population who were trying to promote swimming, the US population, and my coaches. It just seemed like everyone was looking at me. The pressure didn't go down well with the Jamaican idol, as she touched twice in ninth place, missing out on two finals. But, but as the athlete she is, Atkinson took the positive from the negative and learned an important lesson. Don't look at the media. <laughs> Having already been to three Olympic Games, Atkinson explained that her stubbornness contributes to her motivation in the pool. I always think I can do more going into a race. I accomplish what I want to accomplish, but I am already looking forward to the next one. Atkinson said three Olympic Games means 12 years of world-class swimming. At 26, Atkinson already had more Olympic time, sorry, Atkinson already had more Olympic experience than most Olympic athletes. Such a successful occupation demands copious amounts of time, hard work, and patience. In Aaliyah's case, her dedication to her craft through her hard work, practice, and focus constituted all the makings of good, deep breathing. The toxins here were the impact that the media had on her. It caused her to lose focus. The loss in focus was a breakdown in her breathing and so it started to affect her craft. Luckily, she realized what was happening, and so she identified the issue affecting her work, and she worked towards it. Our, tox our toxins don't necessarily have to be an external force, but sometimes it is our very own thoughts. We formulate an idea for something that we want for ourselves, but don't even give ourselves the chance to act upon it. Because we tell ourselves, I can't, or I don't have the time. These negative thoughts have been inhaled into our consciousness, and so have prevented us from fostering healthy thoughts. This makes deep breathing difficult to achieve, and so we have limited ourselves in achieving our good. It is important to note that the start, that it starts, sorry, first and foremost in the mind. You have to tell yourselves what you want to achieve. Picture those goals 
and then actively work towards them. Keeping the mind healthy with healthy thoughts will contribute to the development and maintenance of good habits. I'm going to pause here just for a reminder, and I'm sure Reverend John will back me up on this one. It's the end of January. How are we going with all our goals so far that we set at the beginning of the year? I know I have started some. Lateness being one. Okay, I gave seven slips of paper to various individuals. I believe Reverend Anne has number one. Could you read it for me, please? Identify the habits. Most of the time, we are no longer conscious of our habits, good or bad. So the first thing you need to do is become aware of them. Who has number two? OK. Make the decision, and then the commitment to change. Of course, this is easier said than done. How many times have we said to ourselves, yes, I should exercise more and eat less? I do. Not to worry. I'll get around to it sooner or later. Procrastinating just makes it harder to change the habit. The longer you put off taking action, especially when health is concerned, the unhealthier you or the situation you get. Conscious commitment is necessary because that's what it takes to get the wheels of motion in action. Number three. Discover your triggers and obstacles. In order to develop good habits, we must be aware of what our habits are. All of us, in moments of weakness and vulnerability, need support or a release for our frustrations. We all have bad days, but we need not resort to unhealthy habits to alleviate the stress. Likewise, we cannot let boredom, anger, or anxiety be triggers for bad habits either. Look for healthy ways of dealing with triggers and obstacles. Number four. Formulate a way forward, a way in which you will work towards changing and maintaining your goals. Number five. Employ visualization and affirmations. Visualization and affirmations are great for integrating the new habit into your routine. While visualization is a powerful motivational tool and energizer, Affirmations program the subconscious with the right mindset for establishing a new habit. Together, they allow you to feel and imagine yourself carrying out the correct behaviors, making it easier to adopt a new habit. Didn't it sound like Reverend John wrote that one? <laughs> Number six. And number seven. Doesn't have to be anything big. <laughs> what about chocolate? <laughs> but these are just seven ways 
in which you can cultivate good habits. Now, the one which Reverend John received spoke a lot towards affirmations. And, I, and as I said, it all begins in the mind. And you have to tell yourself certain things. So I have about 13 affirmations here that I'm just going to read off. I am capable. I know who I am and I am enough. I choose to be present in all that I do. I choose to think thoughts that serve me well. I choose to reach for a better feeling. I share my happiness with those around me. My body is my vehicle in life. I choose to fill it with goodness. I feel energetic and alive. My life is unfolding beautifully. I am confident. I always observe before reacting. I know what time and effort I can achieve. I know with time and, time and effort I can achieve. I love challenges and what I learn from overcoming them. And finally, each step is taking me where I want to be. Once you have forged your way forward by employing these techniques, you will unlock your potential. Breathe deep, inhale your good, renew, remember, and employ these good habits and experience the odds that you will defy. Namaste.